Good morning. I'm Amy Loggins, and I am counsel with Taylor English Duma, a law firm here in Atlanta, Georgia. I am here on behalf of Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta to talk with you today about the what I call the alphabet soup of labor and employment law with a focus on employment discrimination laws that might impact your organization. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you about Pro Bono Partnership if you haven't already done your research. It's an incredible organization here in Atlanta that maximizes the impact of pro bono engagement with a network of attorneys um, who can give free legal advice to nonprofit organizations. If you would like more information about whether you qualify to become a client to work with Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta, the criteria is listed later in this presentation. A little bit about me. I work, as I said, for Taylor English Duma, which is a full-service law firm here in Atlanta. Prior to joining Taylor English, I was in-house employment counsel for Crawford & Company for about eight and a half years. And before that, I was a trial attorney for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. A lot of the stories and tales I will tell you come from my days of being the civil rights lawyer at the EEOC. So I'm going to give you a little bit of flavor of both sides of the pictures of the laws. But before we get started, I wanted to just talk with you a little bit about the enforcement agencies. Uh, there are a few federal enforcement agencies that you will come across when and if you ever have an employment or a legal employment issue. The first one is the Department of Labor, the United States Department of Labor. And it administers a variety of laws, but the ones that you will most likely come across will be the Fair Labor Standards Act, which deals with any wage and hour issues, minimum wage, overtime, that nature. The Family Medical Leave Act, which will apply to you if you have 50 or more employees and will impact that better? Okay. and manage, will uh, impact you if, you if you have 50 or more employees and it determines and, de and guides you through leaves of absence for family or um, medical leave issues. The Department of Labor also administers the OSHA, the Occupational Safe Health and Safety Act, the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, that has to do with military uh, service members who are returning to, to the workforce. And they also at, uh, manage all federal contractor compliance, which could also impact anyone who has federal grant money. They also keep up with all the labor statistics, um, and they get a lot of that information from the State Departments of Labor. The next agency is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. That agency, which is the one I used to work for, administers the uh, uh, civil rights legislation that most people know about, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Discrimination and Employment Act, the Rehab Act, Act of 1964 and the Equal Pay Act of 1963. They also administer the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, and I'm going to mention it later in the presentation as well. There are a few other agencies that you also might come across. The Department of Justice, which enforces federal statutes with regard to race and citizenship discrimination. The National Labor Relations Board, which enforces the National Labor Relations Act. Most people think of them as having to do with unions, which it, they do, but it also does apply to non-union employers as well. And the Department of Homeland Security, which now houses uh, the Customs and Immigration Services. People used to know that as INS, Immigration Naturalization Services. It is now under the Department of Homeland Security. Okay, the ABCs. I call it ABCs because there's always uh, some letters that apply to all of these laws. So I'm going to walk you through them. But before we do, I'd like to just explain to you as an overview that these laws are, were put into place with the purpose of ensuring that employers are making decisions, employment decisions about people 
without regard to stereotypes and assumptions based on their protected characteristics. So employers should not assume, for instance, that a young newly married woman is just going to have babies and not come back to the workplace, or that an older worker doesn't know or can't learn new technology. And employers shouldn't refuse to hire someone because he wears a yarmulke or cannot work on his Sabbath. Those are the types of things that we're talking about when we talk about these civil rights laws. So the first one, in alphabetical order, actually it's not, actually, I take that back, age comes before Americans with Disabilities Act, but the letters, uh, the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. This law was passed in 1990, but in 2008, President George W. Bush signed into law the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendments Act. And what that did is it overthrew 18 years worth of case law upon which we all relied when it came to disability law. Congress declared that the courts had not been interpreting the law the way they intended, and so they passed the Amendments Act to make sure that the courts were doing what Congress intended for the law to do. So for the past few years, we lawyers have been starting over and playing catch up and trying to figure out what it all means now. So what I have for you on the slide are the new definitions, and I'm going to talk through some of the details with you because the landscape has changed. The definition of disability has not changed. The definition of disability is still either, under the law, one, a person has a physical or a mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, or the employer regards the person as being disabled because of a limp, a speech impediment, something of that nature. Or the company or the employer has a record that the person has a disability. So there are three different ways that someone could be disabled under the law. Now, major life activities, the definition for that changed substantially. It used to be that major life activities were things like seeing, hearing, walking, talking, caring for oneself. And Congress said, no, we meant for this to be broader. We want it to include a lot of conditions that weren't included in this, the years of case law that has developed. So they expanded the definition to include activities such as concentrating in order to get disabilities like ADHD covered, interacting with others in order to get the autism spectrum disorders covered. They also included the operation of bodily, major bodily functions into the definition of major life activities. So now if you have a, if your bowel system is substantially limited then because you have Crohn's disease, then you are a disabled person under the law now. Immune systems, they wanted to make sure that HIV was covered. Um, reproductive functions, Congress wanted to make sure infertility was covered. There are things like that are now covered very clearly by the law. The other thing that Congress was very clear about was that these impairments can be episodic and, or in remission. So if you've had cancer and it's in remission, you're still a protected individual under the ADA. Episodic things come up with migraines, allergies, um, smell sensitivities. If you've ever had to deal with hygiene issues or burnt popcorn in the workplace, or the gentleman who just bathes in Old Spice, they can now become ADA issues if you have someone in your workforce who has smell sensitivities that rises to that level. So whenever, let's go to the next slide, um, someone asks for something in the workplace, an ergonomic chair, I need to move my desk because I can't concentrate, things like that, you should treat it as though it is a request for accommodation. If someone does come to you and requests an accommodation or has a disability, the employer has an obligation, an absolute obligation to enter into the interactive process with that employee. And what that means is that you sit down and you discuss with that person what the disability is and what he or she needs that will enable him or her to perform his or her job. 
and you have to have the conversation. Sometimes that does require getting medical certification, especially if, it, if it's going to require time away from work. But you have to have the conversation. And then if they can identify something that the employer can give them that will enable them to do their jobs, then you have an obligation to provide that. And that's what's called a reasonable accommodation. There are many, many things that are not reasonable accommodations, um, such as indefinite leaves. You don't have to turn the page yet. Um, <laughs> indefinite leaves of absence, things that are exorbitantly expensive. But I will caution you that cost is often not a reason to deny an accommodation. OK. The next one, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the ADEA passed in 1967, is one of the older, pun intended, civil rights legislations out there. Um, it protects employees who are over the age of 40. So therefore, you cannot treat people over 40 less favorably than you treat people under 40. But there's another catch to this. Even within the protected category, you should not and cannot discriminate be within the protected category. So the example I gave you in the slide is that you can't treat someone who's 45 more favorably than someone who's 64. They're both protected, but even within the protected category, you can have discrimination. When I was at the EEOC, I loved age discrimination cases. And the reason is because if I had a jury trial, everybody on that jury is getting older. If they're not over 40, they're going towards 40, they've had a parent who's been let go at 64 and was unable to find employment, it's a very easy jury argument to make. But in addition to that, there are almost always comments or conversations. It often arises in the context of conversations about people's retirement plans. Employers are trying to do some succession planning and cross-training, and they need to know whether this person's going to be around next year. Um, so there are often comments. And for goodness sakes, please avoid the black balloons and the over-the-hill birthday parties, because <clears throat> those have come up in cases as evidence of this age bias and pointing out how old people are. So I give you that as a, as a cautionary tale. Age cases often come up in the context of reorganizations or reductions in force because the companies or the employers are trying to, they're doing it because they have to eliminate some expenses or cut costs. And often the more expensive salaries are the older workers, the people who have been around the longest and who have gotten promotions and salary increases over the year, over the years. So sometimes the the place where you can get the most bang for your buck in a reduction in force is by taking out the highest salaried people. Unfortunately, we often see that that has an impact on older workers, and that can be actionable under the law. So be very, very careful. OK, the next one that I'm going to talk about is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It's called GINA. It's one of the newer laws with which we are dealing. And it prohibits the use of genetic information in making employment decisions. Now, I know you all are probably thinking, I have no idea what my employee's genetic information is, and how could this possibly apply to me? And we employment lawyers thought the same thing. Unless you're sending people to an oil rig in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, you often don't do medical testing or genetic testing. However, they, this law includes medical information. Genetic information includes medical information and family medical history. And that's where employers are seeing that they have information. Your employee comes to you and says, I've been diagnosed with breast cancer. My mother had breast cancer and her mother died from breast cancer. Well, now you have genetic information under this law. And if you use that information or even probe too far to find more information, you could run afoul of this law. Again, it's very new. There hasn't been, I don't think there has been one case. Maybe there's been one case under this law. It's often tied to the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
as an additional claim to the ADA, but we haven't seen a lot of activity in this space, so I can't give you a lot of good information or guidance about it except to just be careful. Okay, Title VII. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is the one that most people know about. This is the one that protects people based on race, sex, religion, national origin, and color. And I will just point out to you that yes, color is different from race. And I have, when I was at the EEOC, I sued a company for color harassment, which was um, a legally fascinating case. But as an employer, you should be aware that they are two separate protected categories. Um, and it, Title VII laid the groundwork for all the legislation of the point is to avoid stereotypes and assumptions about people. It's also very clear under Title VII and the other laws um, as the case law has developed that you can run afoul of the law if you intentionally discriminate against somebody. For example, I'm not hiring her because she's a woman. Or you have a neutral practice that has the impact of discriminating against a group of people. Um, one way that you could have a disparate impact on a group of people is word of mouth hiring. So you have all of your employees refer their friends to you, and what happens is as you look back over your hiring practices over the past few years, you say, huh, I've only hired women under the age of 30. I have no diversity in my workforce. Um, so you may find, and companies have found, that they have had a disparate impact on a racial minority, on gender, religious basis, language basis, uh, because of word of mouth hiring. I tell big companies all the time who love to do sales and marketing through golf outings that maybe they should find another activity or because I actually have had a couple of cases where female sales executives feel like they were not given the same amount of opportunities to get to know the clients or to develop the business because all the all of those opportunities were given to their male counterparts to go to the golf course never were they asked to participate it people just assumed that the women did not play golf and did not include them. So that's a seemingly neutral practice, but it had an impact on them and absolutely impacted how they or whether they were able to earn as well as their male counterparts. That's where these cases will come up. On the next slide, I talk, I've expanded a little bit more about Title VII, about the, how the Pregnancy Discrimination Act was passed to make sure that anything that has to do with pregnancy and childbirth is wrapped into Title VII because it is therefore gender discrimination because except for the one gentleman who was on Oprah, men cannot get pregnant. So if someone is getting rid of all of their pregnant workers, that means they're getting rid of all of their female workers and that's how this gets pulled into it. Like age discrimination, pregnancy discrimination cases often have comments, comments about women's bodies that come back up in the litigation as proof of either harassment or discrimination based on the pregnancy. The odd element, one odd element about Title VII is that there is a religious accommodation requirement under the law similar to the ADA accommodation requirement. If an employee has a bona fide religious belief and a bona fide religious practice that he or she must observe, then the employer has an obligation to try to accommodate that request. And I will caution you not to use your own personal knowledge to decide whether a religion is a bona fide religion or not, because a lot of companies and employers over the years have gotten caught up in assuming that Rastafarian, Rastafarian I can't say that word. Rastafarianism um, is not a religion. It is. Or that Wicca is not a religion. It is. And so you need to be very cautious if someone says to you, I am Wiccan and I need the solstice off, that you don't assume that it's not a bona fide religious observance and that you do need to accommodate that request. 
uh, again, another EEOC story for you. I had a lot of religious accommodation question, um, issues that came up when I was there, often with Seventh-day Adventists who needed to be home by sundown on a Friday to observe their Sabbath. Well, it's not daylight savings time, and you have to get from Camp Creek Parkway to Duluth by 5 p.m. on a Friday. You have to leave pretty early. <laughs> so the requests were often, I need to leave at 2 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and it's not just because I'm trying to get to Athens for the football game. I have a bona fide religious belief that needs accommodating, and companies and employers had a hard time sometimes with how do they then accommodate that request. But there are absolutely options for you. You just have to find them. The other one that comes up is often with dress codes. And this is going to take you into the fourth bullet point on this slide, client-directed employment action. Um, I had a case post 9-11, very soon after 9-11, where a woman was denied a job working the counter at a dry cleaners because she wore her burqa. And the reason that the employer gave was that, well, my clients, my customers, don't want to walk into the dry cleaning store and see a woman in a burqa. And we said, well, that's discrimination because you're making that decision based on her religious observance and nothing, and possibly her national origin. So. That is absolutely discrimination. Uh, so you, if your clients or customers ask you to do something that runs afoul of these laws and you do their bidding, then you violated the law. It's no excuse that they just won't, they don't want a woman working on it or they only want um, a young male working on whatever their issue is. That is discrimination under Title VII. Okay, equal pay. Equal Pay Act applies to all employers. Oh, and I should have told you earlier, the one, the laws I just talked about only apply if you have 15 or more employees. So some of you may not have 15 employees, but you should watch, because as soon as you hit that 15 employee threshold, that's when these laws start pertaining to you. The Equal Pay Act, however, only apply, applies to everybody, just like the Fair Labor Standards Act. So if you have two employees, uh, one male, one female, you need to ensure pay equity for them. So if they're doing substantially similar work, they should be paid substantially similarly. Uh, if you don't and the woman is paid less than the man, then that is also a Title VII violation and an equal pay violation. There has been in the past some legislation introduced in Congress to change this law, um, but it has kind of fallen flat every single time. I should also say that right now, well, you know what, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to hold that. Uh, okay, the National Labor Relations Act. That is a law, like I said earlier today, that is in, in, um, enforced by the National Labor Relations Board. And it is the statute that governs all union activity. But it also applies to non-union employers and a lot of nonprofits actually have seen some activity on the NLRB um, radar lately. Usually it's having to do with social media. And there's a very the very first big social media case that came out of the NLRB was against a nonprofit organization called Hispanics United. Um, and the board, even though Hispanics United was not unionized, the board went after the nonprofit organization uh, because they fired employees who were posting a, and having a conversation on Facebook about the working conditions at the organization. Um, the theory behind it is that social media is the new water cooler and employees under this law have an absolute right to discuss pay, benefits, their workplace. That's how unions come to be. Employees talk, they decide they need help, they decide to come together and uh, negotiate with the company for better pay, benefits, et cetera, working conditions, um, which is why that activity is protected by the law. Because if they can't do that, then they can't ultimately decide that they want a union. So the NLRA, um, I, I gave you some examples of things 
that the law prohibits, just so you could see some some um, of the things that they've gone after. But I can tell you that social media has kind of been their hotbed lately. Okay, harassment. I do harassment separate from Title VII. I think most people think of harassment as sexual harassment because that's what has gotten a lot of the um, notoriety over the past couple of decades. And sexual harassment is falls under Title VII as gender discrimination. But harassment's bigger than just that. Harassment is any sort of harassment based on any protected category. So it could be harassment based on a disability. It can be harassment based on age. Um, or some sort of medical history, the family medical history. So in, oftentimes people will, you will have a policy, hopefully you have a policy, that prohibits harassment, and it should prohibit harassment of all kinds, not just sexual harassment. Sometimes people take their policies a step further and protect even things outside the federal law, such as sexual orientation. That's the item I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, but whatever your policy says, it's important that you enforce it. If you're not going to enforce the policy, then it's just a hollow policy and you shouldn't have it. But harassment, there are two different kinds of harassment, and you guys have probably know about this, but quid pro quo, which is sleep with me or you're fired type of harassment, and hostile work environment, which is the conduct, it's the jokes, it's the abusive environment, it's the if something is pervasive enough in the workplace to be harassing, um, then it could be considered a hostile work environment. I think that term has been batted around a lot, uh, but there are some definite thresholds that have to be met before it's considered a, an unlawful hostile work environment. The behavior has to be very severe and very pervasive. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide, which is retaliation. Again, retaliation covers all of the laws we talked about, and there are anti-retaliation provisions in each one of them. There was a Supreme Court case a few years ago, though, that came out and very clearly said, retaliation is anything, this is the second bullet point, retaliation is anything that deters employees from coming forward. It's anything that can cause a chilling effect in the environment, in the workplace. So some examples. I had a case from a client who, the, in a staff meeting, an employee said, "I feel like I'm being I feel like I'm being discriminated against because of my race." And the manager slammed his hand down on the table and said, "We're not going to talk about that here." And the EEOC found that that was retaliation, because when they spoke to the other employees, the other employees said, "I'm not talking. I'm not ever going to come forward and complain about discrimination because look at how he." acted when she did. So his actions had a chilling effect in that office. What he should have done was say, I hear you. This is not really the right time and place for this conversation. Why don't we talk about it afterwards? The message isn't much different. It's how he messaged what he said. I've also seen cases where people discourage employees from reporting Activity, reporting harassment, you don't need to go to human resources for that. Or you don't need to tell the director about what just happened. Or you didn't talk about what happened at the party Saturday, did you? Those types of activities can produce a chilling effect in the workplace and would be considered retaliation under the law. There is one, um, there are a couple of different Georgia specific items that I included here. Uh, one of them, in the city of Atlanta, the city of Atlanta absolutely prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and perceived sexual orientation. I think they use the word preference in their law. Um, so the city of so if you are within the city of Atlanta uh, city limits, you are governed by this provision. A lot of companies and organizations have included sexual orientation anyway, even if it's not part of the law. Um, but you don't necessarily have to. I will caution you, though, that the federal Congress has, um, the Senate approved, I think, two weeks ago, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. Um, and I think it's in the House right now for passage. And if it does pass, 
then sexual orientation will be a federally protected category, and it will most likely be treated just like Title VII um, and administered in the same fashion. So keep watching Congress to see whether that passes. I think it will in, at some point in the near future, it will. Okay, I'm gonna take you through an EEOC process very quickly before we wrap up, because I think this is one of those processes that a lot of organizations are unfamiliar with, and if you get an EEOC charge, a lot of people, if it's the first one, they just don't know what to do. So I thought I would just give you a little bit of pointers of what happens when you get that charge in the mail. So an employee in Georgia has 180 days to go to the EEOC and file a charge of discrimination. In Georgia, it's 180 days. In other states, it is 300 days, but here it's 180. Um, and so if they, if you, if a person is fired and they think that the termination of their employment was discriminatory, they have 180 days from that date to go file a charge of discrimination. At that point, if the employee decides that he or she, or former employee, if it's a former employee, decides that he or she would like to participate in mediation, the employer will get a letter asking if you are also interested in mediation. Pardon me. The mediation process at the EEOC happens first. You'll get a charge of discrimination. If you agree to mediation, you do that first. It's free, and they typically take place at their uh, offices in downtown Atlanta, which is near the Five Points Marta Station. Um, if you go to mediation and it does not settle, or if you decline mediation, then the process is that the charge goes to an investigator with the EEOC, and the employer is asked to provide, <clears throat> provide a position statement, which is basically your response to the charge of discrimination. And they will probably ask you to provide documentation to support your position. Then the investigator will interview people, collect the data, and decide whether to find that there was cause to find that there was cause of to find that there was a finding of discrimination or there was not cause to find discrimination. And he, he or she may decide to do an on-site investigation, which is coming out to talk with your people in person. Once the investigator makes their no cause or cause decision, um, well, let me back up. If they find no cause, and send the I found no cause to believe there was discrimination letter, the employee then has will get it, what's called a right to sue notice, and then the employee will have 90 days to decide whether to file a lawsuit in federal court. If the EEOC issues a cause determination, they will ask the employer whether you would like to conciliate or settle the claim. At this point, the EEOC has decided that yes, there was discrimination, and now they're talking to you as an advocate on behalf of the employee. Prior to that, they are acting as a neutral fact finder, um, and, but once they decide there is cause, they change hats and now advocate on behalf of the employee. I also, the next slide gives you some pointers on the pros and cons of deciding whether you want to mediate. Um, for those of you who have not been involved in mediation, mediation is a very uh, inexpensive, can be inexpensive, an early resolution to a claim. It has a lot of value in that it gives the employee a chance to be heard. You sit across the table and the employee can say, hey employer, this is where I think you wronged me. And there is a, a lot of cathartic, that's a very cathartic process for the employees, just to be heard, just to vent. Um, and it can also give you an opportunity to explain to that person why you made the decision that you did. Um, and it, you can also find out what exactly, sometimes the charges of discrimination are not very detailed, so you can find out during that process what they really are worried about and concerned about, and you can address those at the mediation and try to air it out and find a good resolution. Um, some cons to mediation or that you're going to have to bring some money to the table. Um, it's highly, I don't think it's, I've ever been able to mediate a case where there was no money involved except when you offered reinstatement 
uh, the employer can can offer reinstatement to the employee. But if you are unwilling to make an, a monetary offer, it's probably not the best forum for it. Um, and you also, it's time. It's a day away from your operation, but you may decide that that time away is well spent. Uh, and I'm a huge advocate for um, mediation, because especially when there are a lot of hurt feelings. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good way to resolve claims early. So if you get an EEOC charge, here are the things you really need to be able to do. And if you don't have the resources in your organization to do that, Pro Bono Partnership is a great place to turn to find um, another resource for you that can help you through this process. So don't feel like you have to do it alone. But what you really need to do is investigate, collect all the information you can, email data, time card data, whatever it is that you need. Um, you might want to interview your own employees or people who may have witnessed the event or um, overheard things. And then you'll need to prepare a position statement and cooperate with the EEOC investigator to get them the information. The EEOC does have subpoena power, and so if you don't cooperate and give them the information they need, they can go get a subpoena to get the documents. It's just much better if you go ahead and cooperate with them um, and help through the process. And then as you get into your own investigation and collecting of the documents, you may say, you know what, I need help. And that's when you need to either call Pro Bono Partnership, get your attorney um, or your HR consultant involved to help you navigate through this process. Okay. Any questions? I'm sure you have a ton. <laughs> We're looking just a moment. Okay, I was clear. Uh, well, if you do have questions after today, after you have digested some of this information, feel free to contact me. My contact information is here, or you can contact Pro Bono Partnership directly. Again, here is the eligibility slide um, to become a client of Pro Bono Partnership. And there you go. There's the contact slide. Okay. Thank you very much.